Welcome to our next lecture on the transcriptome. Please don't copy or distribute. So the learning objectives for today are to really understand why people sequence RNA, um, really to identify what are the different kinds of RNA that people typically target in an RNA sequencing experiment. More specifically, when we're looking at the expression of protein coding genes, Oftentimes, uh, tools such as splice junction databases are used, so it's important to understand how they're constructed and, and how do we use them. More generally, I want you to get a broad understanding of the different ways in which people typically quantify relative expression of genes. And so again, when we're talking about uh, using RNA sequencing to study, say, protein coding gene expression, there's a number of common but distinct ways that people use to uh, take reads that you would generate from an RNA sequencing experiment and quantify how much does each gene uh, get expressed in the cell at a given time. And finally, I want you to take away some understanding of what the effect of batch effects are and what, what exactly batch effects mean in terms of RNA sequencing experiments. So after we have a discussion about the general idea about bulk RNA sequencing, We'll then pivot to talk more about more recent technologies, more specifically in the field of single cell RNA sequencing, which has kind of taken over uh, the world since 2016, 2017. And so I want you to understand the general advantages of single cell RNA seq over classical bulk RNA seq experiments, uh, and also to gain some basic understanding of what the practical challenges of analyzing and collecting single cell, single cell RNA seq data is. More specifically, uh, in terms of the uh, classic single cell RNA sequencing protocols, they can be broadly divided into two categories, one of which is called three prime taking and the other of which are called full length transcript methods. So it's important to understand the broad difference between how these two types of methods work and what their relative advantages and disadvantages are. More specifically, uh, especially when it comes to three prime taking methods, which are typically higher throughput, uh, a type of technical noise called dropout events are highly prevalent, and so it's, un it's important to understand what exactly a dropout event is. And in general, what are the uh, sources of technical variation in gene expression measurements uh, when, you, uh, when you assay single cell transcriptomes? And so the first obvious question you should ask yourself is why, why bother sequencing RNA? And so the answer is that it's perhaps the most, the easiest direct readout of the relative abundance of different transcripts in your genome. And so relatively speaking, uh, there, there are other kind of proteomics based measures for measuring the abundance of actual proteins, but those are much more difficult to perform uh, in practice and they're much harder to generate comparable measurements across multiple samples or studies. And so RNA sequencing is, is a direct readout of relative abundance of transcripts. And it is, and people have figured out in large part how to compare RNA seq data across multiple studies and things like this. Not only that, but sequencing RNA has a lot of different downstream applications. And so the most classic kind of uh, experiment you would do after doing RNA seq is you would do differential gene expression analysis. So differential gene expression analysis is the task of looking at gene expression measurements of samples uh, from multiple groups. So this could be like a case control study, for example, and just identifying sets of genes that are significantly different in average gene expression between, between those groups. And so a couple of potential applications would be, for example, looking at the expression of genes before and after you treat cells with certain compounds to identify what the potential targets of those compounds are, uh, looking at, uh, say, disease versus normal samples to get an idea of uh, how gene regulation changes with uh, disease pathology, or looking at, for example, uh, knockout mice, where you've uh, knocked out specific transcription factors and measured gene expression before and after to try to get an idea of what target genes might be regulated by a given transcription factor. There's a whole bunch of other applications 
uh, beyond differential gene expression. So for example, you can uh, use RNA sequencing to identify uh, novel transcripts, or even just identify uh, regions of the genome that are transcribed uh, that weren't previously known to be transcribed. And so, uh, for example, in uh, certain types of uh, cancers, uh, it's pretty common to see certain types of fusions between different genes. And so through sequencing RNA, you can identify these kind of uh, novel fusions of different types of genes. Uh, you can also uh, use RNA sequencing to identify different transcription start sites. Um, it's also useful for observing RNA editing. And so um, what the central dogma uh, doesn't really talk about is the fact that uh, RNA isn't, even mRNA isn't necessarily just directly translated into proteins. Uh, oftentimes there's mechanisms in place to edit RNA uh, before it's translated. Uh, and RNA editing can have a wide variety of functions and including regulatory functions. Uh, RNA expressions oftentimes also used to detect what are called EQTLs or expression quantitative trait loci. And so we touched on these briefly in the human genetics lecture, but basically uh, a large part of the human genetics community is interested in characterizing the mechanism of action of how genetic variants associated with complex traits and diseases work. And so one way in which they do that is that not only do they genotype individuals and phenotype them at the organism level, but they also can use uh, RNA sequencing, for example, to detect changes in gene expression that are associated with different genetic variants uh, as a means of kind of identifying what potential uh, genes might change in regulation with respect to genetic variants that sit in, for example, enhancers. RNA sequencing analyses are also used to study essentially time series analyses, where, for example, you might be interested in looking at how gene expression patterns change with continuous processes like, uh, say, the cell cycle process or circuiting clocks or, say, differentiation of uh, embryonic stem cells or even reprogramming of, for example, iPSCs. And finally, it can be used in conjunction with some of the other uh, technologies that we talked about in class. So, for example, you could use CRISPR-Cas9 to either introduce certain genetic variants or uh, epigenetically shut down uh, the activity of certain enhancers or promoters or so on. And then you could, for example, perform RNA sequencing before and after perturbation to understand what the effect of, for example, shutting down an enhancer is in order to identify what potential target genes uh, there are for that specific enhancer.